we're going to take you through um, just some of the design and construction components of the different uh, projects that we have within Century Square. Now, how many of y'all were able to make the tour last week? Was anybody there? Oh, so quite a, oh, wow, a number of you. So you guys were able to kind of touch and feel and, and sort of experience the project under construction, get a feel for the scale of the project as it's being built. Um, and we appreciate all you guys coming out for that. That was enjoyable. So I'm going to talk about um, the multifamily component. It's branded 100 Park. It's 250 units of Class A multifamily apartments. Um, Jonathan touched on it a little bit. One of the challenges that we faced with 100 Park from our capital partners was, you know, what are what are the comparable apartment projects within Bryan College Station? And as, as Jonathan mentioned, a lot of times I was telling him, well, there aren't any. And you know that's not necessarily entirely true because you guys, as you know, have a lot of student housing projects that are a being built or have been built within the last two years, and even more kind of coming down the pipeline. And some of that product um, is very well amenitized, and uh, and actually some of the rates are, are are pretty impressive. So you know this this project is not directed towards students. However, we may see some graduate students or some law students. Um, but really, you know, potentially it's targeted towards young professionals. We sort of see uh, Bryan College Station as, as a growing community, and Century Square is going to offer an amenity base that we think will help, help us drive um, value here within the project. Um, touching on a little bit of the program within 100 Park, as I mentioned, there's 250 units. Uh, it's about 60% one-bedroom units and about 40% two-bedroom. Average unit size is about 880 to 890 square feet. Um, it's wood frame construction with a 10,000 square foot retail podium. And what's really cool about that podium piece is it affords us uh, 11 foot floor to floor ceilings on the ground floor. So that'll be a different um, experience for the apartment um, submarket uh, here in College Station. You don't see a lot of units where you can have those tall ceilings. Um, and then as you go up, you'll have nine foot six on the second level, nine foot six on the third level, and ten foot on, on, the, on the fourth floor. So it's definitely a differentiated product. Product will have stainless steel appliances. Andrew will get into a little bit more of this, but stainless steel appliances, granite countertops, and a wood flooring. Um, and one of the things that's unique is we'll actually have two separate courtyards. One that'll be the pool courtyard, and one we call the quiet courtyard. Um, as well as a fitness center, uh, clubhouse, and leasing. So we drew from you know things that we see within the Houston marketplace and the surrounding submarkets, but also sort of what we're seeing today in College Station. So we think it's a good hybrid. And, and another sort of interesting component is we'll have structured parking as well as some surface parking. So residents will be able to 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 have that access to to safe structured parking. You know where they can easily access the building. Um, they're not parking, you know, a mile away and having to walk. Um, and one of the things that Jonathan also touched on too is when, when you're talking about master planning, we spend a lot of time on, you know, are we positioning this component in, in, in the way that sets it up for the most success within a mixed-use project? You know, there's a lot of different components going on here. How do you fit and plan each of them? You know, so, so where you know the sum of, of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, um, and we think we've done that here with 100 Park. Um, so as you can see, we're we're moving we're moving along. They, these guys are, are racing away, and, and we'll start uh, transitioning this asset over to property management um, June and July of this year. Uh, and then we'll, what we're doing is we're actually delivering the building in two separate phases. The first 150 units will be delivered August 7th, and then the remaining 100 units will be delivered in December of this year. Uh, so that's the timeline for the multifamily. A lot of this stuff is all pushing towards that summer of 16, fall of 16 delivery. Um, and then uh, I'll have Clayton come up here and, and talk to you guys a little bit about the hotel components, which are really exciting. You guys are going to really enjoy it. Um, definitely you need to the marketplace, that's for sure.
Thanks, Bryson. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is Calvary Court. Uh, so Jonathan alluded to it, but what we'd really like to deliver to the marketplace um, is get termed kind of boutique hotels a lot of times, but really a lifestyle product um, that's really tailored to the guests and that complements the region very well. So this is, this is uh, Calvary Court, uh, our partner uh, Valencia Group, who operates the hotel and city center hotel Sorella with us. Uh, they're our partner on this deal. This is actually a concept um, they dreamed up, and they have Lone Star Court in Austin, Texas, in the domain. If any of y'all are familiar with it, um, but it's it's really an interesting um, hotel. It's it's inside out. The entire experience is based around the courtyard. Um, so you walk into this main reception building, and you're just gravitated to this immaculate courtyard with a with a pool and fire pits. And there are actually uh, four barracks buildings and one larger officer's uh, quarters building. Um, so you're drawn out, you see all the rooms. Um, each room opens up to a front porch overlooking the courtyard. So it's a great opportunity for a uh, group and event business, whether you're coming up here for a game or uh, graduation weekend. or We think there will be a, a large market for uh, businesses trying to do some team building. Uh, exercises out here. Um, it, it's inspired by uh, the military history of the region, um, Calvary Court. Um, Calvary really paying homage to Parsons Mountain Calvary within the Corps of Cadets. The layout's very regimented, uh, ordered structure, um, but it's really a, a very unique hotel and one that will be uh, new to the region. Uh, so as you can see, construction's well underway, uh, like the multifamily um, it's it's uh, all wood framing, uh, so we poured the foundation. We're uh, getting further and further along with the framing. We should be dried in on all the guest room buildings by March. Um, so here's a model room in the bottom right uh, picture. We actually built in one of our uh, empty shell spaces in Houston. So we want to make sure we build the model room and walk it with everybody, make sure the layouts just as we intended, make sure the furniture mixes and matches well, that uh, there aren't any revisions that need to be made. You want to build it once before you build it 140 times and miss, <laughs> and miss a component. Um, so we're very excited uh, for Calvary Court. Uh, as I mentioned, construction's underway. Uh, we are projecting to open right with football season, uh, the first games of September 3rd here against UCLA. Uh, so the second hotel we're doing is the George Hotel. And this is more of a conventional hotel building structure. It's kind of a horseshoe shape. It also lends itself to a courtyard experience um, with the pool and the floating kind of pavilion restaurant out in front. Um, we're doing something really special uh, to the property. There's a, there's a ton of established live oak trees out there and we're making an effort to preserve as many as possible. Uh, so as you saw in the Midway promo video earlier, um, there's uh, the relocation of those oak trees. So it's a company called EDI, they're Aggie owned and operated. But they really pluck the, the trees out of the ground, they inflate these cylinder bladders and roll them from their, their current spot to the new location. So that's really something we're excited to do across the project. Um, some of those will flank the George and the Plaza that you saw earlier. Um, and really bring a sense of establishment to the entire uh, project. Because you know, you see these new developments, a lot of them have these twig trees and they need support. Uh, it's just, it's, this really softens the landscape. We're excited to do that. Um, the Georges also pays tribute to the region's um, um, past, mostly agricultural. Um, it lends itself to kind of the railway system, uh, College Station, as you can see. Here, this is kind of a subtle design aesthetic in the carpet. Those are designed to be switch tracks, like on a uh, railroad. Um, but a lot of leather, uh, millwork, wood, carpentry, um, steel, brick, um, really lends itself to the southern hospitable feel. Um, this picture here on the left is kind of an open atrium foyer that'll have a, a bar in the evenings and uh, really be a great informal place uh, for university events or um, just any kind of, we, we 
intended to be a local hangout as much as it's being catered to the out-of-town guests. So as Jonathan mentioned, it, it really fits center uh, with the entire property. Um, and so these guests can spill out into the pool, courtyard area, and out onto the plaza. So there'll be a lot of activities, live music, um, bonfires, and a bunch of other exciting things. So this is a construction. Uh, we're set to pour the foundation over the next 10 days, and then we'll uh, proceed into the wood framing. Um, intend to dry in the building and do all the weatherproofing interiors uh, in April. And we're hoping to open with the football season as well. But, um, it's a similar construction activity as seen here. Um, but again, we're very excited about both products. We think they complement each other very well. Um, they're both tailored to the market and the area's past. And the culture we have here in Bryan College Station, coupled with the university. Um, there are a lot of operating efficiencies having uh, Valencia Group uh, operate both of them. You know, we only have, uh, or we have one general manager for both properties. We'll have one chief engineer, the same back of house accounting. So that, again, from a business standpoint, that really drives your bottom line. Uh, so very excited about that. Um, the location, uh, we've talked about Century Square as a whole, but from a hospitality standpoint, it's nice to have a destination where you could come in Friday evening, park one time, check into your room, walk to dinner, walk to campus, walk to the football game, whatever purpose you're here, and you don't need to get in and out of your car for each you know, daily activity. You wouldn't have to get back into your car until Sunday, whenever you're leaving. Um, but that's, uh, those are the two hotels, and with that, I believe we're taking a five-minute break. Okay, great. <clears throat> the leasing strategy for Century Square. But first of all, I wanted to kind of tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, for me, by far, this is the most exciting and really the highlight project of my entire career. Uh, for reason being, my background actually uh, is in architecture. I attempted to practice architecture. I studied architecture and it was uh, part of my uh, beginning career, but I ended up sidetracking and got a little bit involved in retail and then eventually and finally into retail leasing. So with my background in architecture and design as well as retail, combining all of those experiences, um, I have to say that this for me is uh, the highlight, like I said, of my career and working on this project has been fantastic working with the development group, with our design team, our development team, our construction team, and then finally uh, talking to all of the retailers around the country, the local retailers, regional retailers, and then the national retailers have been uh, very, very rewarding for me. So I'm going to just kind of dive in because I have only 15 minutes to go over the retail leasing portion of this presentation. Um, so to begin, I think it is really important to understand our customer base. So rather than jumping right in and talking about all of the exciting and wonderful tenants that we're going to be bringing into Century Square, I wanted to give you an overview of our customer base. So uh, the reason why we want to know about our customers uh, is because we wanted to see what is a trade area, how many potential customers there are in our trade area, and what is the potential of spending in the trade area. So with that said, Bryan College Station has more, a little bit over 200,000 permanent residents, a student population of 63,000, and on top of that, last year in 2015, 1.6 million visitors, um, or uh, we hosted uh, 1.6 million, million visitors to the area. Um, so with that said, um, that is a, all of these people combined make up our core customer base. Uh, so that's a, a, that's a pretty impressive number of uh, customers uh, that we're looking at. Next, we want to know what is the potential um, spending um, in this uh, uh, trade area that can be generated. So what we typically look at is a census data. We look at 
uh, the population, and then from that population group, what is their income? Um, it's a little bit trickier um, in College Station because, um, or in Bryan College Station, because we have the huge student population, as you can see. So what happens is that most students, as you know, don't work or work part time. So when you tie or fold them into the general per permanent population, it drives the income way down. And so what we did was we segment out the student population and looked only at the permanent residents. And what we discovered is that the household income is significantly <coughs> higher. It is at uh, almost $89,000 a year. Furthermore, when we dug into the details and looked at the student population, we discovered that their family income, based on where they live and their parents, their income are even higher than the permanent residents. It is actually 96,000. In fact, 25% of the student population household income exceeds $127,000 a year. What that means is that there is a lot of spending power in this trade market that is not so apparent when you're just looking at the census. So the opportunities for us is uh, that college, Bryan College Station is truly an underserved market, mainly because people are looking at the data, they're looking at a college town, uh, thinking that there isn't really that much disposable income, uh, but that is not uh, true, as you can see in our in-depth uh, research and study. Uh, the challenges for us in this project is really, again, the perception College Station, Bryan College Station, it's a small town, it's a college town, there can't be that much disposable income. But that is not true, as I just mentioned. And I think more and more people and developers are recognizing the spending power of college towns. And then, um, so they're, they're, they're recognizing uh, the opportunities, they're understanding that the demographics are skewed, and so, um, so I believe that no longer with our project coming on board that College Station and Bryan is, is going to be an up and coming market and people are going to recognize and see the potential here and it's not going to be underserved for much longer. Um, the other challenge we face actually, um, we can overcome the perception and we can talk about the data to show retailers and to, uh, to show other people how the demographics are skewed and that household income and spending power is a lot more than what is shown. But what we don't have control over is actually the slowing down of the economy. It's not picking up, the recovery hasn't picked up as fast as uh, people want. So some of the retailers have been scaling or holding back their expansion plans. Um, and then on top of that, I didn't put on here, but many of the retailers who are expanding are still right now facing, trying to figure out what is the new economy, the new model for them. So right now, they are trying to execute an omni-channel where um, online, on all platform, all cross-platform, and then integrating that into the brick and mortar. So what I'm discovering is that while they're trying to figure that out, they're not ready just to let go of the leash and go, hey, you know, um, even though they're looking to expand another 10 or 15 stores, but they're taking a little bit longer to try to figure this out. So what is our strategy for leasing? And, and in my world, is retail leasing. So for us, across the board, on all of Midway, uh, Midway's projects, we don't lease space just to fill space. So we approach leasing very strategically and very disciplined. So what we try to do is to curate the spaces uh, carefully uh, with a careful mix and a thoughtful mix of retail tenants. And not only that, we work really, really hard to try to also convince the tenants that this is the best position on the project for them. So this is a very new product to a lot of the retailers. They don't really understand the, uh, uh, the best space on the project is really the inner core, the plaza. What they're used to is, I want to be on the street front with my signage, on a street with lots of cars and visibility. 
And so from our experience of having developed City Center, the best performing stores and the best performing restaurants are actually on the plaza. They're not facing out to the street. In fact, some of our best performing restaurants have a sign and it's hidden by a tree. You don't even see the sign. And so from a retailer perspective, there's a lot of, uh, a lot, we know our project way more than they do. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of really explaining so that they can really understand the project and what we're trying to do here. Um, the other thing about uh, curating um, a very thoughtful mix of tenants is that we try to seek out tenants that will support the vision of the project. And as you have heard, our vision for Century Square is that it, it is a regional destination. And so the tenants that we have been working with and bringing in are tenants who will bring value to that. So tenants who really understand the local market, the smaller market, and then they have some uh, leverage uh, that they can bring to the project, such as name recognition or a following. Um, and we have a few of those tenants that we will show you. Um, and then obviously, um, for us, drawing a comparison and our experience working with City Center and Leasing Center um, is so tremendously useful. So for us, we know from the very get-go that restaurants and entertainment are the first two components um, on the commercial side that is going to support the project. And then the retail is... The, uh, is, is the second piece that will follow. So we will open the project with restaurants, entertainment, hospitality, multifamily, and office. And then uh, retail will be there, but not fully there. It will lag behind a little bit by maybe about six months, if I had to guess. So now <laughs> I get to brag a little bit and kind of tell you what we have so far for the project. So we have signed on Studio Movie Grill. Uh, they are taking 40,000 square feet on the second floor. Uh, you saw earlier the position uh, right next to the garage. It is going to be an eight theater, uh, full food service all throughout the, um, uh, the show. Uh, there will be a premium bar as well. And um, the... Um, uh, they have 23 locations currently uh, spread across uh, 10 states. Um, I think it's going to be a fantastic experience um, and it's going to be great for College Station because there's nothing like it here right now. Uh, one other tenant that we've signed on is Blaze Pizza. Um, they are taking 2,600 square feet in one of the jewel boxes um, right in the, the heart of the plaza. And so Blaze Pizza is a fast casual fire pizza. Uh, they can make your pizza perfect uh, to perfection within 180 seconds. And uh, they have 50 locations across the US. I think this is a great addition for the plaza. It's quick, you can get in and out, get your pizza. They will have a large patio. You can kind of enjoy the experience out in the plaza or whatever events and happenings that are out there. It's uh, You can uh, just pick up your pizza and go wherever um, on the project or you can sit in the patio or in the restaurant. On the um, front fronting University Drive, we, get, we have a few pads. So one of the leases that we signed is Neighbors Emergency Center. Uh, they are a Texas brand. And uh, they are seeking to really change the experience of emergency room. Uh, there will be a doctor on call 24 hours a day. And uh, they're doing really exciting things um, in their space uh, to make uh, the experience of coming into an emergency situation more relaxing. Uh, so it'll have um, modern decor as well as uh, private treatment rooms. It's designed to make you feel way more comfortable in a really, really stressful situation. Uh, currently, they have 26 locations across Texas, and we're really pleased to have them on board with us. Uh, we also have a restaurant signed on, Moe's Irish Pub, and Moe's Irish Pub, for us, uh, our experience with them, they have a location in Houston at Vintage Park, and they are a great operator. Uh, 
um, very, very hands-on, uh, attention to detail. Uh, we looked at a few national pub brands, but when we put them side by side, we chose to go with Moe's because we knew the operator, we knew the passion that he has. He shares the same value that we have in terms of uh, how he treats people, the care he takes in uh, customer service and all of that. And we felt that his group will do a very good job on our project versus say, say going with a huge brand and we don't know who's actually gonna be the manager managing uh, the operation and then you know how long they will stay or you have this revolving door. So that's another really important decision for us when we choose between who we're gonna go with. So Moe's Irish Pub is going to take about 6,200 square feet on one of the front multi-tenant buildings facing out to University Drive. Uh, they're going to have a patio on the ground floor as well as a rooftop. Uh, so the menu is American Grill. Uh, they're going to have about 36 hats and live <coughs> entertainment on the weekends. Another home, uh, Houston homegirl that we're going to uh, bring here to College Station is Berry Hill uh, Baja Grill. And Berry Hill is going to take about 4,000 square feet in the building that um, is in the uh, center plaza with offices on top. Uh, they're going to take 4,000 square feet. They'll have big, ample patio on the plaza as well. And uh, Berry Hill is highly acclaimed in Houston. Um, actually, they're known for their tamales. Uh, ever, um, uh, they've been in business since 1928, um, and it's been a, a tradition for Houston. And so we're really, really pleased uh, to bring that tradition from Houston to, to College Station for you. And um, it's a full service as well as a counter serve restaurant, and it's a broad a variety of menu that's Tex-Mex. And then some of you guys uh, may have traveled to Austin and are very, very, very familiar with Hop Dottie. Hop Dottie is going to take about 3,500 square feet in one of the jewel boxes um, adjacent to Blaze Pizza. And uh, so um, if you've known about Hop Dottie, you know about the cult following. It's phenomenal. Uh, there's a line outside their restaurant at all times of the day. And they uh, specialize in crafted burger. Uh, they ground their meat um, in-house every day. Uh, they uh, uh, bake the buns twice a day. Um, all of their potatoes, uh, french fries are hand cut from the potatoes. And uh, so I think that it is um, uh, something that is uh, very unique uh, to experience. And uh, we are really, really thrilled uh, to get them on our project. Currently, they have 10 locations. Some of the other brands that we are working with right now are currently talking to and negotiating. Um, as mentioned, we try to get a mix of local tenants uh, some recognizable regional names, as well as some well-sought-after national brands. And so here are some of the people we're talking to. Kendra Scott, Victoria's Secret, uh, Nike, Zoe's Kitchen, Bath & Body, uh, J. Crew Mercantile, Lululemon is testing out a store here uh, in College Station, and um, when they're ready, uh, our project is uh, on the top of their list. And then Sephora. And Sabi, uh, some of you ladies might know, they are a little uh, homegrown boutique here, and very well known by a lot of the sorority girls. And so they are very, very excited about our project, and we're uh, very, very close to working and bringing, uh, bringing them onto the project. And uh, Piata, Italian restaurant, uh, fast casual, and then Bite is a sweet, uh, bakery out of Houston. So this is just a short list of some of the retailers that we are working with at the moment. We also have 60,000 square feet of office above the two retail buildings in the plaza. And so right now we're working with Texas A&M for about 14, a little bit over 14,000 square feet for some office space. And then Brown, Reynolds, and Watford, an architectural firm, is also 
uh, looking at uh, some of the office spaces, about 7,000 square feet on our project. Wells Fargo, as well as Merrill Lynch, um, are in talks with us to take some office spaces as well. Uh, in addition, we're talking to some of these larger brands uh, that are looking to have a uh, place here in College Station. Some of them are looking uh, to be here for recruiting purposes. Um, so it's all very exciting. So thank you very much for uh, your listening ears. I'm going to pass it, uh, my, uh, or I'm going to pass the stage over to Courtney, and she's going to talk to you about marketing. <coughs> about the branding of Century Square, which I think that process is lost on a lot of people when you just go experience a place. Um, but there's a lot of intentionality um, and time put into that particular process. So this, for us, took several months and set up several iterations between our whole team, you know, weighing in on their opinions. So we started with these taglines and pillars to build the brand off of, really just encompassing what the community is going to be that we're creating, what's already here and what we're building, and how people are going to experience it. So this was some of the visual inspiration that went into the branding. Of course, this um, is directly from Texas A&M. And then this is kind of the agricultural mechanical inspiration from the community here. And then some of the architectural inspiration pieces. So here you'll see some of the very early iterations of the brand, um, and this is just a, a very um, short sampling here. I mean, I think we went through 20 or 30 marks at one point, um, but you can kind of see how this evolved, and um, we were really drawn to this idea of making it look like an actual brand, um, you know, that you would do to cattle. Um, and just thought that that was a really strong mark that could be applied throughout the natural and built environment as well. So you'll see here, this was the final mark that we arrived at. Um, and the, the top portion of the mark can actually um, filter through our color palette. So you might see it appear in our secondary colors as well. So this is the brand. Um, and like I said, this process took quite a while. Um, and so um, now speaking through the marketing of the actual project, um, which begins now, you know, and that's kind of why we've brought Jenna on now in the pre-development phase of the project, because we think it's really important to start talking about the project and building the exposure in the community and not just waiting until our business is open. Um, so a large effort that we undertake is through public relations, which, um, you know, some of you may have already read about the project um, through local publications here, the Eagle, the Battalion, um, or seen us on TV. Um, so, so far we've worked with a third party PR firm actually out of Houston um, for some of our initial PR pushes. Um, so that included our official groundbreaking event and press conference in November of 2014. Um, in addition to some recent announcements like our first signed tenants and uh, the introduction of 100 Park, uh, the multifamily component, to the market. Um, and so this process involves writing and distributing press releases and trying to secure media coverage. Um, and probably from here on out, we will um, support this function in-house um, through Jenna and our creative team. And then advertising, um, of course, is a great avenue for marketing the project. Um, you know, we always at Midway believe it's more impactful to have others talking about our project instead of us talking about our project. So we're very selective in terms of the outlets that we choose for print and digital advertising. Um, but, you know, we have taken advantage of some of the local publications here, um, the football program, um, visitors guides will be things that we look at in addition to some regional publications, you know, maybe Texas Monthly or the Chronicle in Houston. Um, so just really evaluating all of those opportunities that are available here. Digital as well, um, through website and social media advertising. 
And then really just finding creative ways uh, to place us in front of the community here in AM. So maybe partnering with um, you know, the, the stadium to have some advertising on game day or things of that nature. And then signage and collateral is part of our program as well. Um, so if you've driven by the site recently, you've seen that we have two very large uh, site signs fronting university. Uh, so that's, of course, a great opportunity to really capture the drive-by traffic there and tell everyone what's coming. Um, so we'll continue building on the signage program you know, as we have more to talk about and um, more structures there in place. Um, and then also, uh, just early now, we're working on leasing and marketing collateral, which um, if you didn't pick up one of our packages on the way in, please get one on the way out. Um, and you'll see, you know, really one of the pieces that Vaughn and her team presents to prospects to help uh, market this as a place they'd like to be. Um, and then also, of course, e-blasts and e-marketing. Um, we'll have, you know, once the project is fully operational, we'll have a monthly newsletter that we send out to all of our subscribers, keeping them in the loop. Um, and then once we're, you know, fully operational with the plaza in place, we will have a very, um, active events program, so we'll have um, advertising and promotional items um, to go with those. So you may have visited just our placeholder website, which there's a print screen image of that in the upper right hand corner. Um, so that's just a very um, small sampling of the information that's eventually going to be available through our website. Um, so we are currently in the process of working with a third party firm, Street Sense, out of Washington, D.C. Uh, to build a full, fully functioning website. Um, and so, you know, we're really intentional about how that information is presented because there's really a lot of information that needs to be included, you know, whether it's a new prospect checking out the website or someone looking to visit and needing to know how to park or even someone looking to lease an apartment. They'll have that capability through the website as well. Um, and then the website gives us a great um, opportunity to really dive into Google Analytics on the back side of things and really learn more about our target audience and, and how they're experiencing the website. Um, and then we'll have a very interactive social media presence, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, anything else new and cool that comes out, um, we'll integrate. But um, that, that we find is a really great way to interact with our customers. Um, we use it. Um, across all of our projects and, you know, find that people really find a lot of value there. And then, you know, I think we've touched on this somewhat already uh, throughout the presentation, but just our events and programming and activation of our projects is uh, very central to everything we do. I mean, even in, you know, building a place um, where marketing is involved in the early conversations about where to put power, you know, so that we can make sure the band can plug in. And, so, I mean, really everyone's on board in terms of how these projects will be experienced and activated in the long term. Um, so here you'll just see some imagery from our various projects and, and how we program those. Um, City Center, you know, we've spoke about a lot today. It's in the bottom left-hand corner here. And, you know, we have 300-plus events every year. Um, and we envision for this particular project having somewhere around 200 events a year. Um, so that's everything from live music um, to game day activities, um, markets, wine tastings, you name it. Um, and we really use our common areas as an opportunity to partner with the community. Um, we work with a lot of nonprofit organizations or even student organizations that you know, need a venue to host events. Um, we really like to try to open ourselves to those opportunities and to giving back. Um, so it will be a very highly activated area, um, and it should be a lot of fun to come experience, um, both for locals, visitors, um, you name it. And so with that, I will turn it over to John and Andrew with our property management team. Um, as property management, asset management, uh, basically once everything's set and done and everyone's left the project, it's us, up to us to make sure the, the center operates as it was intended and the users function within it as we designed. And if they don't, it's up to us to correct it. So um, our first major mixed-use project for Midway, which is City Center, 
Uh, the good thing about being the second major multi mixed use project uh, by Midway is we get to learn from everything that went wrong at City Center. We get to learn from the mistakes we may have made with parking or with trash or with putting restaurants on the second floor um, and what problems that can cause that we need to make sure we specifically address before we move on to leasing up the lower floors. Um, and we're taking the opportunity now, having brought me in a year early as the GM of Century Square to work with the city center team to see what they're going through, to see what they deal with on a daily basis, and to understand how Midway functions operationally and internally. It can, allows me to pass these on to the city center, uh, Century Square staff and crew. Um, Century Square and City Center both operate as an association. Everyone who comes in and uses our project and leases uh, a space within our project is a member of this association. It allows us to uh, fund not only the function, but also the upkeep of the, uh, the interior, the common area space of the, uh, the center. Um, not only that, it also provides the architectural guidelines for this property. It allows us to make sure that the center stays looking as we would like it to, even as new tenants and new users come into it, to make sure it's not a mixed and matched looking center. It's all uh, one way, it's all unique, and it's all original. Um, as I said, my early integration uh, was helpful in allowing me to uh, not only work with the city center staff to get experience, but to also work with development. To, to understand what they were thinking in the design phase and then to have the discussion of will that work in a real world setting? Is where we put the, the dumpsters and the uh, garbage enclosures, is that going to be effective for not only our tenants, but for the contractors to be able to get to that and to be able to successfully remove it from the property? Um, it allowed me to work with the multifamily, with Andrew, to make sure that we can partner in, in finding contractors and finding people to work on it so we're not doubling our efforts, not wasting our time uh, covering the same tracks. Allow us to work together to find people who will serve the property as we both want. And then finally, to work with leasing, to work with Vaughn to understand as those tenants sign leases, whether it's someone who wants composting that we hadn't intended, to make sure we're planned for that, to make sure we understand where signage is going, what our signage requirements are, making sure we're getting that approval done in a timely manner so that it's not holding up our leases. Um, and then finally, working within the community and the market here. Um, I'm privileged to have been here early, to have gotten my family here early to learn about College Station, to learn about what goes into College Station, the makeup of College Station, how people move around this area, how bicycles are utilized at the university, how buses are utilized uh, to meet and make connections with the contractors that are in this area so that we can find the people who Midway feels will work best with us, to find those people who share our values. So all of those things have been very beneficial to making sure that this property, when it's all said and done, will function the way uh, we would like it to and has the integration within the community to be successful. Uh, 100 Park is the uh, residential multifamily component uh, of Century Square. Um, it is, uh, like Bryson said, it's a 250 unit market rate project deal. Um, our rents are about $1.70 a square foot, and our average unit size is um, right, up, right under 900. Uh, so our whole dollar rents are right around 1500. Um, we will have some uh, strict rental criteria. Uh, we're typically need to make three times the monthly rent. Um, so that does put the, 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 the bottom income right around 54000 um, <clears throat> To talk a little bit about the difference between market rate and student housing, uh, obviously student housing is a cyclical along with the, uh, with the college year. Um, it's typically a 12-month lease. Um, your utilities are included. Um, and obviously the demographic is for students. Um, the market rate project, um, we will do... Lease terms anywhere from three to 12 months. Um, we'll have a rent revenue management system that's set in place and it, it will vary depending on your lease term, your move in, your move out, um, and even occupancy. Um, <coughs> uh, the demographic will be a little bit older. Again, a lot of that's based off of uh, kind of the, the uh, threshold for income as well. 
Um, in regards to underwriting uh, and demand for product, um, the underwriting, we did kind of have to back up into the underwriting. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of market product uh, for us to, to use or historical data uh, for a market rate project. Uh, but we did use some of the student housing. Uh, we did have to take out some of like, the, uh, the utilities per square foot. So you know, if you have a student deal that's running $1.82 a square foot, after taking out utilities and making some other adjustments, maybe you might be closer to $1.70 or $1.72. Um, <clears throat> operational timeline, uh, we will start our pre-leasing and marketing here in March, April timeframe. Um, we'll have a, a manager on site, uh, we will have a leasing, um, and they'll start doing some of the marketing and pre-leasing for the property. Uh, we'll bring the rest of the team on in July, August timeframe, um, and when we get a, Part of the units, we'll get 150 of the units in August, and then we'll get the rest of them in December. Uh, our typical lease up time frame is around 12 months, uh, so we anticipate uh, stabilization in around uh, August 2017. Uh, we, we did talk a lot about, everyone's talked a lot about synergies of mixed use developments. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, I mean, the retailers and the restaurants, those are all amenities for um, the apartment complex. Um, you know, we will have increased rents due to the fact of this, and we'll, in, in return, we'll have um, increased value. And then, really, on, on the other hand, too, I mean, we'll have probably close to 500, uh, 500 residents that will live there. That will be a good core base for the retailers and the restaurants. So, I can't underscore enough the work those guys do, well, that everybody does, but, so, it's easy for, you know, myself and some of the development guys to say, we have a vision, we're going to create this great thing, don't bother me about trash, I don't want to talk about trash. Well, at the end of the day, you got to take care of the trash, and if you think about how our properties operate, our business looks a lot more like Disney than it does typical property management. They're open, you know, our projects are functioning seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and every day is a show. And it is, uh, they, they do an, an amazing job. So, all right, so I'll talk to you a little bit about financing. Um, financing mixed-use projects is, is somewhat uh, challenging and, and unique and um, from a number of standpoints. And so here's some of the considerations. So, College Station in the institutional investment world is considered a tertiary market. Typically, the only institutional capital that's investing in college towns is student housing. Is that fair, Sydney? Yes. All right. <laughs> Got the pro here, I guess I should check. Um, so, the other is scale. So, just phase one is $171 million, right, with future phases to come. So. Um, while we raise friends and family investment, I don't have enough friends or family to raise $171 million. And so you have to have an institutional uh, capital source. Mixed use flexibility. So the reality is, while we're trying to develop this project with all these pieces, the market, both in terms of leasing, demand, capital, and ultimately maybe a sale, all happen on different timelines, right? The appetite for a hospitality investment is different than the appetite for a multifamily investment. So I'll give you an example in City Center. We ultimately did sell the multifamily. We couldn't look, about two years ago, we couldn't look at our institutional partner and say, now is not the time to sell when cap rates for multifamily were at an all-time historical low. At the same time in that time frame, hospitality actually had not come back into favor, which it has now, although not Houston at $30 oil, but um, so you have to maintain this, this idea of while you have a vision for one project, all these things operate as distinct and unique investments, and inherently you need some sort of flexibility to deal with that. And so on an exit strategy, you may, be, you may want to sell one component uh, versus another. 
An important piece of this, and Andrew touched on it, is the Commercial Property Owners Association. And think about an association like this, is it effectively operates like a city operates. It is the <coughs> central structure that manages all the things that are common to all the uses. So it manages marketing, common area, trash, uh, security, parking, right? So you have all these shared things and not you can't have, even though we're common to, to all these uses, you can't have all these different owners trying to do all these different things. You have to have one vision for it. So what the community or a commercial property association does is it manages all of the common areas and then it takes all of those expenses and then allocates them out to all the different owners. And so it's actually a, a very important piece uh, of the puzzle from an ownership standpoint. So when you look at uh, ways to finance a project, there's kind of four ways to think about it, right? You can have a single equity source and a single debt source. You could have single equity, multiple debt. You can have multiple equity and multiple debt. And you can have multiple equity and single debt, right? And there are different reasons for doing any one of those. So as an example, city center has multiple equity and multiple debt. And that project, basically for every use, meaning multifamily, retail office, um, uh, what I miss, hospitality, we have a different equity partner for each one of those, and we have a different lender for each one of those. So this um, project was unique for really the, the, the one reason, it, it's easy to get capital, institutional capital to Houston, not right now, um, but it, it, College Station is a different animal. And so what we ended up discovering is we kind of find, we found a needle, needle in a haystack with a company called Harrison uh, Street Realty Advisors in Chicago. They raise money and build funds. Their sort of investment thesis, if you will, is they want to invest in what they deem as the recession-proof industries. So they invest in medical, education, and um, storage, right? So they believe in any market, those things uh, do well. Um, under education, they have primarily done student housing and they feel like student housing is largely overcooked. It's harder and harder to find opportunities, and so they were looking for a new way to invest under their education umbrella. <coughs> that was the opportunity we presented them. And so the structure we're using is this, which is we have one institutional equity partner in all of it, but it's still a really big deal for one lender to do, especially in a smaller market. So we have a separate lender on each piece. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So this is what the ownership structure looks like. So we have a master joint venture between ourselves and uh, Harrison Street Realty Advisors. And what happens is when we bring in an institutional equity partner, we are also required to invest, called a co-invest. And it's a pretty simple philosophy, right? Put your money where your mouth is. Have some skin in the game. And so in this one, what are we pricing average? What's our co-invest? Uh, we're 20. Yeah, we're about 20% of the capital, of the equity capital. Um, so Harrison Street's doing the other 80. So what you have is then sub uh, partnerships that are separate ownership entities governed by the master joint venture. So we have one for the commercial, one for the multifamily, and one for each hotel. So what this affords is one um, is risk mitigation, right? If one fails, it doesn't impact the other pieces, which is important. None of them are going to fail, but you do it anyway. Um, the other is that then allowed us to have a lender for each separate entity, uh, which was important. And then also we had a unique situation with the two hotels where we wanted our operator, uh, Valencia Hotels, to also have some skin in the game. And so you'll see uh, in the equity box, there's both Midway and Valencia on the co-invest piece. And so, so you see for each one. So on the equity side, for the commercial, we have Midway uh, and Harrison Street, and then we have Bank of the Ozarks. On the multifamily, same on the equity side, different on the debt side. The George. Same on the equity, different on uh, the debt. Actually, we do have the same lender on both, but for risk mitigation purposes, you still separate them. The other thing then it allows us to do, if for some reason we ever want to sell one piece, we can sell one piece. 
because most people don't want to buy an entire mixed-use project. That's starting to change. People are coming around to the value of buying a mixed-use project. But still in large, a lot of people want to invest you know, or have an appetite for one product type. And so it'll be someone who wants to own multifamily or someone who wants to own retail. So that's, that's the reason we do it that way. Um, it generates a ton of paperwork. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Um, but uh, but it, it, it is the right way to do it. And so you've actually seen some projects fail, uh, mixed-use projects fail, because they try to do it under one ownership structure. Um, they don't have the flexibility. Um, the other thing is, is we underwrite each piece each of those pieces on a standalone basis. And in our book, every one of those should make investment sense, right? The investment discipline on a standalone basis. Where people get hung up and where they mistakes in mixed-use projects is they lump it all together, and the reality is there are pieces that are being subsidized, and that's a no-no, right? It does not make sense to subsidize something, right? I don't know why you would necessarily do it. Um, so that's sort of the investment discipline part is to make sure that when you know, when First Tennessee Bank makes a loan on 100 Park, while they understand all the benefits and the value created by the project, they also have to feel very comfortable that 100 Park on a standalone basis is a legitimate revenue-producing, income-producing property. 